Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Katrina Rivera Baluyot. I'm a pulmonologist from the Medical City, and today I will be discussing EBG interpretation. This is our outline for today. We'll start with ABG applications, then discuss the components of ABG, how to recognize acid-base disorders, and how to interpret and correlate them. I'll also, I will also show you a video later on how to perform the procedure. <clears throat> so when do, we, when do we request for an ABG? We do ABG to measure gas exchange and ventilation status, as well as oxygen status. It is usually done to assess patients with respiratory diseases such as COPD, respiratory failure, infections like pneumonia, and for monitoring during invasive and non-invasive ventilation. We also do ABG to check for acid-base balance disorders in diseases such as DKA, kidney disease, sepsis, and shock. In performing an ABG, the most commonly used artery is the radial artery since it is superficial and it is easily pal palpated over the radial styloid process. Um, but we can also use other arteries such as the brachial artery and the femoral artery. The first component of an ABG is the pH. It is based on hydrogen ions present in the arterial blood. So this is the measurement of acidity or alkalinity. Our normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. So anything below 7.35 is acidosis and above 7.45 is alkalosis. And if we see a normal pH, it can be read as normal, maximally compensated or mixed depending on the other ABG components that we will be discussing later on. Um, clinically, we also use a cutoff of 7.4. So anything above that is alkalosis and anything below 7.4 is considered acidosis. PaCO2 is the measured partial pressures of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. So this measures ventilation and it is the respiratory component of the ABG. Our normal range is 35 to 45 mmHg. The more PaCO2 in the blood, it, it is uh, more acidic. And then if there's um, less PaCO2, it is more alkalotic. The next component is bicarb. This is the calculated concentration in the arterial blood. So it is a chemical buffer produced in the kidneys to neutralize the acid. And this is the metabolic component of our ABG. The normal range is 22 to 26 mex per liter. The next component is PaO2, uh, which is the measured partial pressures of oxygen in arterial blood. So the normal range is 80 to 100 uh, mmHg, and it is calculated based on age. To summarize, these are the ABG components and their normal ranges. Um, the O2 saturation is included in the ABG and the normal range is 94 to 100%. To make ABG reading easier, we can follow these steps. So first, we check the pH to know if there is acidosis or alkalosis. Next, we check if the disturbance is respiratory or metabolic. And then, is there appropriate compensation for the primary disturbance? And if the ABG is metabolic acidosis, we calculate the anion gap. If there is an increase in the anion gap, we assess the relationship between the anion gap and the bicarb. Then lastly, is there an adequate oxygenation? Let's go through the steps one by one. So first step, we check the pH. We can use a cutoff of 7.4. So anything less than 7.4, again, is acidosis, and anything above 7.4 is alkalosis. So this is the primary disorder. To know if the disturbance is metabolic or respiratory in origin, we check for the change in the pH and PaCO2. Remember the mnemonics more, so same metabolic, opposite respiratory. So we check the arrows here in the table of the pH and the PaCO2. If the arrows are going in the same direction, there is somewhat metabolic disturbance. 
if it is in the opposite direction, there is a respiratory disturbance. For example, like here in the first row, the pH decreased, so the patient has acidosis, so that's the primary disorder. Since the PaCO2 is also decreased, so they're in the same direction, there is metabolic acidosis. In the second row, the patient has decreased pH, so he or she has acidosis, but the PaCO2 um, increased, so they're in the opposite direction, so there is respiratory acidosis. Now let's analyze the acid-base disturbance. In metabolic acidosis, the main disturbance is a decrease in bicarbonate. So the compensation of the body is to increase minute uh, ventilation or to hyperventilate or to increase the respiratory rate. This will decrease the PaCO2, which will increase or pull up the pH to correct the primary disturbance. So for respiratory acidosis, the main disturbance is an increase in the PaCO2. The body will then respond by increasing reabsorption of the bicarb in the proximal convoluted tubules of the kidneys and increase the hydrogen ion excretion in the distal convoluted tubules, which will increase the bicarb and also increase the pH to correct the disturbance. For metabolic alkalosis, the main disturbance is an increase in bicarb. So the compensation is opposite. Um, there is decrease in minute ventilation or hypoventilation or a decrease in the respiratory rate, which will increase the PCO2 and then decrease the pH. Then for respiratory alkalosis, the main disturbance is a decrease in PCO2. So the compensation is decreased reabsorption of bicarb and decreased hydrogen ion excretion in the kidneys to decrease the pH to correct the problem. So through eyeballing, we can say that the ABG is uncompensated if we see that there is no change in the expected compensation to fix the primary disorder. There is partial or submaximal compensation if we see the expected direction of the compensation wherein the values change outside the normal limits or the normal range, but the pH is not within the normal range. There is maximal compensation if the expected direction of compensation is outside the normal limits and the pH is within the normal range. However, we also need to compute for the expected compensation to check if there is another acid base disorder present. So these are the formulas for expected compensation adapted from the ATS. So take note of them because you'll be using them for our exercises later. For metabolic acidosis, if our actual PaCO2 is less than the computed range, then there is concomitant respiratory alkalosis. For respiratory acidosis, if the bicarb is more than the computed range, then there is concomitant metabolic alkalosis. For metabolic alkalosis, if the PaCO2, the actual, is more than the computed value, so there is a concomitant respiratory acidosis. Whereas for respiratory alkalosis, if our actual bicarb is less than the computed value, um, there is concomitant metabolic acidosis. For metabolic acidosis, we calculate the anion gap using the following formula. The normal anion gap is around 12 mex per liter. For patients with high anion gap metabolic acidosis, um, we should remember the pneumonic mud piles. So these are methanol intoxication, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is one of the more, uh, most common causes. Um, alcohol ke alcoholic ketoacidosis, starvation ketoacidosis, paraldehyde toxicity, isoniazid, lactic acidosis, which is also common, um, ethanol intoxication, and salicylate intoxication. For non-anion um, non gap metabolic acidosis, causes include GI losses of bicarb, such as in diarrhea, 
um, renal losses of bicarb, like in proximal RTA or the use of acetazolamide, and renal tubular disease. For high anion gap metabolic acidosis, we check the ratio of the change in the anion gap and the bicarbonate. Um, if the value is 1 is to 2, there is uncomplicated um, anion gap. If it is less than 1, then there is concurrent nagma. If more than 2, there is concurrent metabolic alkalosis. Lastly, is there adequate oxygenation? So we compute for the desired PO2 for age with this formula. Now let's try a few cases. Um, for the first case, we have a 20-year-old male asthmatic with a chief complaint of shortness of breath. So this is the ABG. As you can see, all the values are in the normal range. So this is a normal ABG. Our second case is a 36-year-old female, no comorbids, with a chief complaint of vomiting and diarrhea. So first we check for the pH. The pH is 7.423. So since this is more than 7.4, the patient has alkalosis. So next is the alkalosis metabolic or respiratory in origin. We check for the direction of the pH and the PaCO2. Since the change is in the same direction, this is metabolic in origin. So the patient has metabolic um, alkalosis. So is there adequate compensation? In metabolic alkalosis, the primary disturbance is again high by carb, and the compensation is an increase in PaCO2. The ABG is maximally compensated because we see uh, the expected compensation uh, in the PCO2 and the value of the PCO2 increased from the normal range and then the pH is now within the normal range. So we compute, when we compute the expected um, PCO2, we note that there is no concomitant respiratory acidosis. The desired PAO2 for this patient is 88.9. So we read this ABG as metabolic alkalosis, maximally compensated with adequate oxygenation. Causes of metabolic alkalosis include GI loss of hydrogen ions, renal loss of hydrogen ions, um, such as in loop and thiazide diuretic use, um, hypervolemia, and chloride expansions in endocrine disorders uh, renal artery stenosis and edematous states such as heart failure, um, cirrhosis, and nephrotic syndrome. So in our patient, her acid-based disturbance may be due to vomiting and diarrhea. Our next case is a 62-year-old male known COPD who came in due to cough and shortness of breath. So first we check the pH. It is 7.382. So this is less than 7.4, so the patient has acidosis. Then next, we check if it's metabolic or respiratory in origin. So the pH and the PaCO2 has an opposite direction in their change. So this is respiratory acidosis. So in respiratory acidosis, the primary disturbance is a high PaCO2. So we expect the compensation as increase in bicarb. This ABG is maximally compensated because of the increase in bicarb and the normal range pH. So we calculate for the expected bicarb. And then um, we see that the actual bicarb is more than our computed range. So the actual bicarb is 30.5. But our computed range of expected bicarb is only 21.82 to 27.82. So because of that, there is concomitant metabolic alkalosis. Our desired PO2 for this patient for his age is 77.34. Um, so our so this is read as respiratory acidosis, maximally compensated with concomitant metabolic alkalosis and more than adequate oxygenation because the PaO2 is more than 100. 
Causes of respiratory acidosis include airway obstruction, CNS depression, um, sleep disordered breathing, such as in OSA or OHS, neuromuscular impairment, ventilatory restriction, increased CO2 production, and incorrect mechanical ventilation settings. Um, in this patient, the respiratory acidosis is likely caused by CO2 retention because of his obstructive lung disease or COPD. Our next case is a 58-year-old female known myasthenia gravis with a chief complaint of weakness and shortness of breath. So again, first of all, we check for the pH. So the pH is 7.28. It's less than 7.4, so this is acidosis. We check if it's metabolic or respiratory. The change in pH is in the opposite direction, so this is respiratory um, acidosis. In respiratory acidosis, the primary disturbance is high PaCO2 and the compensation expected is increase in bicarb. So in this case, we consider this as uncompensated because there is no change in the bicarbs. As we can see here, the bicarb is still in the normal range, which is 22 to 26. Um, when we calculate for the expected bicarb, um, we can also see that our actual bicarb is within the expected range, so there are no concomitant disorders. The expected PaO2 for this patient is 79.06, so we read this as respiratory acidosis uncompensated with adequate oxygenation. So in this patient, the respiratory acidosis is likely caused by hypoventilation due to neuromuscular weakness. Our next case is a 35-year-old female known generalized anxiety disorder with a chief complaint of shortness of breath after an anxiety attack. So we check for the pH. The pH is more than 7.4, so this is alkalosis. The PaCO2 is decreased, so the change is in opposite direction, so this is respiratory alkalosis. In respiratory alkalosis, the primary disturbance is low PaCO2, so the expected compensation is a decrease in bicarb. We read this as partially compensated since the bicarb decrease, but the pH is still not within the normal range. Uh, the desired PaCO2, uh, when we compute for the expected bicarb, there are no concomitant disorders. The desired PaO2 for this patient is 88.95, but since the, our actual PaO2 is more than 100, there is more than adequate oxygenation. So we read this ABG as respiratory alkalosis, partially compensated with more than adequate oxygenation. Causes of respiratory alkalosis include CNS stimulation, um, hypoxemia or hypoxia, stimulation of chest receptors such as in pulmonary edema, pure effusion, pneumonia, pneumothorax or PE, drugs or hormones, pregnancy, and incorrect mechanical ventilation settings. So in this patient, uh, the disturbance is likely caused by CNS stimulation and anxiety, which may have caused hyperventilation. So our next case is a 55-year-old male, known diabetic, um, came in due to fever, cough, and vomiting. So first we check for the pH. Our pH is 7.135, so this is less than 7.4, so this is acidosis. And then next we check for the PaCO2, so this is decreased from the normal range. So since they are in the same direction, the change is in the same direction, this is metabolic acidosis. In metabolic acidosis, the primary disturbance is low bicarb, so our expected compensation is a decrease in the PaCO2. This is partially compensated because the decrease in the PaCO2 is not enough to change the, nor uh, the pH to normal range. So we compute for our expected PaCO2, and then our computed is 24.16 to 28.16. Our actual PaCO2 is less than our computed range, so we consider a concomitant respiratory alkalosis. Uh, 
our desired PAO2 for this patient is 80.35. So we read this um, ABG as metabolic acidosis partially compensated with concomitant respiratory alkalosis and adequate oxygenation. So for patients with metabolic acidosis, we compute for the anion gap. So first we check for the lab, sodium is 129, chloride 98. The patient has elevated RBS with positive serum ketones with a chest X-ray of pneumonia on the right. So using this formula, our computed anion gap is 31.4 plus minus 2. So the patient has HAGMA. So for patients with high anion gap metabolic acidosis, we check for the ratio of the change in the anion gap and the change in the bicarb. So our computation is 1.6. So this patient has pure HAGMA, which can be caused by the diabetic ketoacidosis, and the respiratory alkalosis may be due to the pneumonia. I'll be showing you a video on how to perform ABG. Um, before every procedure, we always um, make sure to introduce ourselves and then check for patient identifiers and get consent. Hello, today I'm going to do an arterial blood ga gas sample. So I've got my pre-prepared tray spread up, ready set up. I've got my patient's arm, I've got some alcohol gel. So I'm going to wash my hands first with the alcohol gel and then palpate for the radial artery. So usually I would palpate both arms and also do an Allen's test to ensure good circulation. So I'm happy with the pulse that I've got here. So I move on to my equipment. So I'm going to wash my hands again with the alcohol gel and then put my sterile gloves on. Okay, so I've got my gloves on. I've got some chloroprep disinfectant for the patient's skin, which I'll apply now. So we don't have that here. We can usually just use and cotton and dry. Alcohol. So the and next piece of equipment it. is our gas syringe. So it's a pre um, self-filling heparinized needle and syringe. Just remove the cap and then holding the syringe like a pen with the bevel up, just repalpate for my pulse. And then when I'm happy with my position, I'm going to insert the needle at a 45 degree angle to go just underneath where I'm feeling that pulse. and then we can see that the needle is self-filling now. So once there's an adequate amount of blood in the syringe, withdraw the needle, placing some gauze on top. And putting, some, putting pressure on that area. You can ask the patient as well to hold that down. So we've Put the cap over the needle and then remove the whole needle, placing it into the sharp spin. And then we can put this cap on top of the needle and using this we can expel any air into that cap. So you'll need to now run this gas using the point of care testing machines. Um, so when you go to those machines, you need to have two pieces of information with you. One is the patient details, and the second is how much oxygen they're on, so the FiO2, and in order to run that gas. So at the end of our lecture, we were able to discuss the following. Thank you, everyone, and good luck.